Thank you for joining us today for our first webinar of our new Human Culture, People, Human Culture Perspective Series, addressing effective people development. As you may already know, especially if you've ever joined us for one of our webinars, an important aspect of the Human Culture philosophy is feed the soil, not the plant. The most successfully sustained organizations are those that, whether intentionally or not, cultivate an enriching workplace where people thrive. Those who believe they are focused on people paying the highest wages or attempting to compete by having the richest or latest fad benefits often encounter extremely difficult stretches when they suddenly realize they must refocus their attention on the bottom line. In fact, it is easy for organizations to be reactive or distracted by all sorts of things that seem to be the most important at any given time. Today's presentation considers a different way of thinking about the performance management process and the various tools and systems used in many organizations. Leaders face a confusing array of advice about how best to handle performance management our goal today is to redirect our efforts and our thoughts from performance management to growth facilitation. Let me introduce myself and our other speakers. I'm Steve Saborn. I'm an actuary and have over three decades of experience in people support, traditionally referred to as human resources. Also benefits and total rewards. I've conducted organizational and behavioral research and take a behavioral approach to all compensation and reward programs. Wes Rogers is our human culturist. He combines his more than 35 years of business and leadership experience, as well as my research and case studies to conceptualize the organization through the horticulture metaphor and apply its principles through the seven dimensions of human culture. Christy is our strategy and people consultant. She has a people support professional. She is, she is a people support professional and a registered nurse with more than 30 years experience. Her areas of expertise include talent acquisition, people and leadership development, employee relations, compliance, strategic planning, employee wellness, HRIS, project leadership, and employee engagement. Let me introduce our first poll. So let us know how effective you think your current approach is to, per, to performance management? Is it very ineffective, ineffective, neither effective nor ineffective, effective or very effective? Make sure you hit submit when you've responded. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and see how we're doing. So as we can see by this graph, uh, the majority felt like they were neither effective nor ineffective, with a few thinking effective and a few ineffective. I will let Wes tell us a little more about human culture and how it is important to today's topic. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, always happy to talk about human culture. Human culture is really a dynamic paradigm through which we can understand, form, and, organ and optimize organizations. It's also a powerful holistic framework in which to make all decisions. Human culture borrows many of its insights from the field of horticulture. Horticulture provides a keen metaphor to understand the organization and its purpose to attract, engage, grow, retain, sustain, and transition the people who interact with it. A good horticulturist understands that success and sustainability of any garden or landscape depends on recognizing and balancing the climate and terrain, the soil structure itself, the available space and fertility of the soil, the arrangement and variety of the plantings, the specific plants and their characteristics, the conditions that optimize the availability and absorption of nutrients, and the desired harvest or value that's to be derived from the garden or landscape. Each of these dimensions uh, very dynamically influences all the others. So similar humaculture is the art and philosophy of creating profitable, healthy organizations conceptualized as soil in which people can thrive. 
Human culture forms the basis for a systematic approach to making all decisions of a business or organization within the context of the seven dimensions of human culture. Our webinar today and this current series is focused on the nine uh, dimensions that primarily relate uh, to performance management, the organization, intangible assets, people, and rewards. Of course, even though these four dimensions are our primary focus, as you may have figured out by looking at the dimension descriptions on the slide, anything we do in one dimension impacts all the others. So the human culture philosophy guides all our work, even when we're engaged selectively on narrowly focused topics, such as in this webinar, traditional quote, performance management. We'll always try to help organizations understand how any aspect of our work can be understood in the broader context of the seven dimensions of human culture. And perhaps more importantly, we'll help them understand how to apply the seven dimensions to make the best, most impactful decisions. You know, horticulture can be a very rewarding experience. I really enjoy gardening, but it can also be extremely frustrating. My plants don't always perform like I would like or desire. Uh, the weather doesn't always cooperate. Uh, pests sometimes attack, reducing the yields or re uh, ruining the appearance of my flowers. Sometimes I realize I've selected the wrong plant or perhaps the wrong variety. Sometimes it becomes apparent that plants need to be transplanted or rearranged. But one thing becomes abundantly clear to me in horticulture and gardening. It is impossible to force plants to grow and produce. My job as a gardener or horticulturist is to ensure that I've created the best soil, design the best arrangement and provide the best support. But then I frequently walk the garden to be sure I really know the plants, to see how they're doing, to identify early signs of stress. Sometimes I pull weeds, sometimes I cultivate the soil or prune or tie up branches. In other words, I spend part of my garden walk finding ways to quote, inspire my plants to grow. Uh, walking the corner, the garden is a real cornerstone of a growth mindset when gardening. But as a manager, my role is likely to help select employees to fill positions based on specific job descriptions, and then quote manage those employees based on the job requirements as well as the mission and needs of the organization. But to manage those employees effectively, I need to frequently check in with employees to know about them, to build rapport, to earn their trust, etc. I'll spend a lot of time listening. So remember, we have two ears and one mouth. These frequent check-ins will prepare me to know almost immediately when something may be wrong, when an employee doesn't really seem to be well-suited for a particular job, or when personalities may be creating workplace conflict. Check-ins, especially if I'm mostly listening and learning, will also identify coachable moments to allow me to edify and inspire the employees within my span of control. So even as a manager, the concept of walking the garden is one of the most important activities as it is in, again in gardening. It's the cornerstone of a growth mindset. So Christy, what do you think? Is it really possible to manage performance? Well, that's a great question, Wes. So thank you for all of you who have joined us today and uh, we look forward to your questions. Feel free to put them in the chat if you have them. Uh, or save them for the end. We look forward to hearing from you. Um, and it's a great question about, you, you know, is it really actually possible to manage performance? And there are clearly concerns about the process because this topic is a constant source of conversation, as we all on this call know. There are likely several reasons that the typical performance management process seldom produces the kind of results that organizations are looking for. And now maybe these indicate that it really isn't possible to actually manage performance, but under each of the typical views or approaches you see on this slide, it becomes clear that performance management process or system may actually get in the way of the real issue. As you can see, Josh Burson, who's one of the leading human resource consultants uh, here uh, in the US is says, does performance management help people get work done? Or is it just getting in the way? So helping people do a great job for the organization and derive personal satisfaction and enrichment from growth opportunities is our goal. So for example, if you view the typical process as a compliance or an HR requirement, 
it can lead managers to lose sight of that importance of supporting and facilitating that employee growth and performance, right? So the performance, the focus becomes the process itself. Likewise, you can have a super cool performance management system, uh, which can draw the focus to the mere task of keeping that system up to date, right? That check the box exercise. The traditional annual performance review leads employees and managers to think of performance management as nothing more than that task that they have to complete. So let's talk a little bit about what employees and managers both think about the management process. And what we're going to see is I don't, I don't think it's going to surprise anyone, right? So employees typically dread the typical performance management process. I've heard say, uh, people say, oh, I'm going to walk that long mile to the manager's office. Right. So how many of you on our webinar today have been through an annual review or two? Probably everybody. Right. Um, were you convinced that you were treated fairly and compensated fairly? Were the criteria that were used to determine your rating or your pay objective aligned with your view of your job? Or was it just based on the value of your contributions? Did you feel your manager was unbiased? Was your review primarily based on one person, your immediate supervisor? I'm forming these all in questions for you all to be thinking about actively right now as we walk through these next few slides. Because the research and our own experiences really do show that many employees working for organizations with traditional performance management processes grumble about the process, even if they might be generally positive about their job overall, right? Employees often feel that that process detracts from their ability to do a good job. It makes them feel the employer doesn't really appreciate them or it makes them feel a little bit like a machine. And guess what? Managers feel very similarly about this process as we can see, right? Um, although I think this woman looks quite pensive, um, I, th I think you know, managers are often feeling far more frustrated, right? They Managers require job duties contribute to the dysfunctional or at least stifled uh, environment that's hindering the employee growth and productivity. The manager's span of control might be too large. The top strategic priorities may not be aligned with achieving those organizational strategic priorities. And in some cases, the culture itself of the organization discourages manager and employee interactions beyond just the basic minimum required for the job functions. So do you all believe that there's a better way to think about performance management? Because we do. Uh, and we really think that in rethinking, uh, we have the opportunity to shift our focus, right? So if it's such a distraction, it doesn't usually achieve desired, the desired results, it's mostly dreaded by everyone involved, then why do so many organizations cling to these approaches? Is there a better way? Can we think about performance managed from a different perspective? Yes, we believe we can, and we have to shift our way of thinking. We must think differently about the organization overall, but more importantly, we have to think differently about people, not as resources, not as capital, but as human beings, when people become employees of an organization, they will make use of that organization's resources to accomplish the organizational goals and produce its products and services. But these employees also want to derive a value from an organization for their own personal growth and development, right? Be thinking about your own position that you're sitting in now. So if we shift our thinking, from one of managing performance to one of facilitating growth, and now begin to walk the garden of our human beings, then we have more opportunity to support our people to thrive within the organization overall, right? Which what Steve and Wes said earlier, the soil in which we plant the people is the organization and how we support them. So that's what you're seeing on this side, right? This shift from the left in the red, to the green of a thriving green garden of opportunity. So let's take this slide and dive a little more deeply into just a couple examples of, of how we might see this operating. So we're gonna start with continuous collaboration. And what does that look like? 
I think everyone feels like, well, I kind of know what this means. And what you see in the quote here, workers who check in with their manager at least weekly are much less likely to be disengaged. And this is an October 2019 blog post from workhuman.com. This, again, as I mentioned, as I started, this has been talked about for many, many, many years about how we do this and how we should or should not do it. Clearly, managers and employees need to have frequent two-way dialogue. The key there is two-way dialogue, right? Continuous collaboration is the essence and the purpose of walking the garden. It's a core element in an effective people development model or approach. And to successfully shift our thinking over to that growth facilitation or that green garden side, it's important to invest the time to know employees, how they're doing in their job, when personal issues may be impacting their work, right? And how that impact, um, how do we find the appropriate resources for them to help address those issues, whether it's within work or external to work. That also means that there may not be a need for the dreaded one point in time evaluation, that this is a continuous effort to facilitate or support that growth over time of this employee in the organization. So let's uh, look at one more piece that I think just flows from continuous collaboration, which is then taking the emphasis off of the process to keep our focus naturally on growth and productivity, which is developing talent for the future. Walking the garden contributes to that overall growth facilitation and is the main focus of this discussion today. Collaboration naturally identifies areas for development and development like traditional performance management is often a word or a structure that is unnatural and forced. And we think it can be shifted to a natural part of that facilitation of growth. And so what you can see above is de developing that talent is multifaceted. It's critical to clearly establish your roles that walking that garden is that central component. There must be regular feedback that goes in both directions. An effective development has to be planned for, not just sort of talked about. There must be a clear understanding of the relationship between what the employee will take from the organization. In other words, what are the real assets distributed through rewards, right? So if I do a good job, I'm going to get something in return. And how the organization benefits from the growth or the development of the employee, which is that created value, right? Which is attributed to the employee's work effort. So all of this that I've just walked through really leads up to um, what a people development model or approach could look like uh, in an organization. And to walk us through that model, I am going to pass it over to Steve. Thank you, Christy. We've covered quite a bit in a short period of time. I recognize that this is only scratching the surface and briefly discusses only a couple of the elements on our shift from managing performance to facilitating growth. So what does an effective people development model look like? How does it facilitate growth? As you can see, it's a continuous process with four continuously cycling elements. Like a garden, business and people are continually changing. Just as there are four seasons in a year, there are four seasons in an effective people development model. Goal setting is important, so everyone has a clear understanding of the organization's destination, their mission, their vision, their strategic priorities, and the individual's goals that will support it. Walking the garden helps you get to know your employees to, so that you can identify signs of stress early. The regular check-ins also allow managers to identify coachable moments. Ken Blanchard's one minute manager tells a story recounting three techniques of an effective manager. The one minute goals, one minute praisings, and one minute coaching. Each of these only takes a minute, but has lasting benefit. Do it on a regular basis. Don't wait there for that one year, once a year time process for performance management. Now, the formal review provides an opportunity then to evaluate talent, assess progress, and rearrange talent based on interests and growth. Some industries require a formal evaluation process to capture dialogue and feedback from others. 
Finally, the formal review leads to opportunities, leads to opportunities to identify development, identify opportunities to develop your talent. <clears throat> there are some very good tools available to capture both the informal and formal interactions to minimize some of the bias that can creep into the review process. When bias or even the perception of bias creeps into the review process, it renders the process not only ineffective, but generally counterproductive. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the development aspects of this in our future uh, series, but let's discuss a few of the biases that tend to render the performance management process ineffective and how we can overcome them. As I'm sure each of you have probably experienced some of these or been subject to them yourself. In, in each of our webinars in this series, we share some insights into how to use behavioral design principles in rewards to help lead people to better decisions. We all use shortcuts to make decisions in life. These mental shortcuts, called heuristics, usually serve us well, allowing us to make effective decisions quickly. But it's important to understand when we are relying on one of these shortcuts so that we can avoid allowing our biases to lead to bad decisions. An understanding of life's little shortcuts also helps us better design things like an effective people development program. Let's consider some aspects of effective behaviorally designed arrangements in our human culture example. Here are a few examples of heuristics from our library that can apply to your performance management process. Rater bias, also known as idiosyncratic rater effect. Research indicates that our annual review process is usually a better reflection of the rater's bias than the employee's performance. The halo effect. If someone has a positive impression about someone, they are much more likely to overlook poor performance. Availability bias. People tend to weight more recent or negative events more strongly. The crowding out effect, incentives that are too large or stressful to attain are actually counterproductive. These are, there are strategies to overcome each of these and more. You get a better understanding of the employee's actual performance and neutralize many of these biases when you ask the manager about how they would involve that employee in future work, rather than ask the manager about the employee's specific performance. For example, you can ask the manager tell, to tell you whether they would keep that employee on the team in the future. This is an indicator as to whether the employee is actually doing a good job or not. Wes, can you summarize for us? Sure, Steve, be glad to. So our goal with this human culture perspective series is to encourage you to think of facilitating growth rather than quote, managing performance. In the garden, thriving plants are productive plants. In the organization, thriving employees are productive employees. Today, we discuss the concepts of shifting our thinking to growth facilitation. An important foundational principle is the concept of walking the garden or continuous collaboration. In fact, it may be the key to helping us change our mindset and focus on growth facilitation. Uh, walking the garden is also a key component of that developing the talent for the future aspect of the people development model. The shift from management mindset to growth facilitation mindset is foundational to the effective people development uh, process and the success of the organization. The remaining webinars in this series will develop this concept even further. So next month, we begin to consider other aspects of this shift to growth facilitation. Successful horticulture often involves pruning. Success at work in life is really no different. So next month, we will consider competencies, where to prune and where to encourage growth. Steve, can you wrap it up for us? All right, yeah. Now let's take a few questions. Let me take a look real quickly. <clears throat> All right, I like the concept of walking the garden. But how do we walk the garden when our employees are remote 
That's a good question. Uh, Christy, would you like to take that? Uh, sure. I am not surprised that this came up as a question uh, from the group because we are all either working in a remote, either fully remote or a hybrid sort of structure with our workers. And I do still believe that walking the garden is possible in the remote setting. This is about going back to setting clear expectations, right? When you have that hybrid work structure, what you need to do is make sure that your employees understand once a week, we're gonna have a quick touch base, whether that's in a five minute huddle on Monday morning or a five minute huddle to close out on uh, Friday afternoon or even Friday morning, you're still getting as a manager the opportunity to interact face to face, not physically, but at least on Zoom or Teams or whatever platform is being used, you have the opportunity to look into their eyes and see how things are going. And I think we all realize that it's easy to see stress written on people's faces. And while none of us can see each other today necessarily, I bet if we could see each other, some people would be at home, right? Some people are in an office at home. Some people are at their dining room table at home. Some people are home because they have COVID or they're recovering from COVID or you know any of those things. But being in touch with each and every one of those employees is exactly what we're trying to, to say here. That's still walking the garden. Reaching out to people and making sure you, that they know you're there as a manager and a leader to understand how things are going. Is there anything I can do for you? What do you need from me to be supportive? Do you need a day off? Do you need to rest? Um, so so it, it still can be done in the remote structure. And I think that it is just as, if not more important, to make sure that you have that face time with your employees in the remote and hybrid structures. Uh, thanks. Uh, we actually have a follow on question to that. Uh, would you still take the walk the garden approach, not just when we're hybrid, but also geographically spread across the globe? Mm. Also, a good question. I am certainly. Um, keen to understanding that now I'm working with a, a client uh, in another country and it's challenging for sure. And I have said to our team, we do need to be online. So yeah, we I do expect that my team shows me on their camera, um, you know, their face and I can see them. And I've had to get up in the middle of the night and do it a couple of times for sure. I think that's what it, a, a good leader and a good manager is about making sure that even though I can't get to that country right now because of travel restrictions, I'm still going to look them in the eye, still going to talk to them, I'm still going to ask them how their day or their night has been and what they need. So I still think we can walk the garden, yes. And in fact, I have, you know, experienced people who have said thank you for asking us to turn on our cameras because it really helps and I'm so happy to see my colleagues. Yeah, I, I would echo that. It, I think it becomes even more important when you're remote or in a different country to have those check-ins even more regularly to let them know that you're still part of the team and be able to sense when things, because if you can't see them physically, it actually becomes harder to to stay in touch. So making that conservative effort is even more important. Um, all right, I think we got time for one more question. This is another follow on. As a flower in the garden, how do you bring to a manager's attention that the garden is unwell? Wes, do you want to address that? Do you want to take a step with that one? Yeah, sure. So if I'm if I'm thinking of this in terms of horticulture or gardening, um, often uh, when I know my plants, when I know the what a healthy plant looks like, uh, I will instantly recognize when something's wrong. Uh, there could be insect damage, or maybe there's leaf curl or yellowing or things like that. Uh, it's a little like the old uh, adage. I don't know if you've if you've heard these, if everyone's heard this, but it's um, you know when you think about identifying counterfeit bills, you learn the real one first. If you know the real one, you can instantly identify the counterfeit. That's a lot like the issue here of walking the garden with employees. 
if I know the employee uh, pretty well, then I'm going to know when I recognize signs of stress. If I don't do that, then I won't likely know whether that's uh, stress that the employee is going under, or maybe I can see them struggling to get their job done and realize they don't have the right tools or resources. So the the idea here is that the manager would be in a in such a good role or such a good relationship with the employees that uh, there really isn't necessarily anything the employee has to do. The manager is going to recognize that that need. Uh, and the other aspect of this, I think, is that when you develop that kind of relationship, it will be very easy for an employee to go to the manager and discuss issues. So remember that slide that says, well, what does this uh, continuous collaboration look like? The very first checkbox on that slide was availability or approachability. And that's two ways. That means the employee has to be available and open to the manager, and the manager has to be open and available to the employee. And that process is really strengthened and developed through that walking the garden process. Yeah, and I know we're sort of out of time, but I just want to add that, you know, if, if the, you know, whomever's asking that question, if you're the employee and you're looking to your manager because you're not feeling that sort of love and feeding, you know, hopefully you have the opportunity to be able to, to step into that light and say, here's what I need. Here's what I'm hoping for from you. And, you know, uh, you know, and hopefully that manager has the ability to respond. Thank you. I think that's it, it for our time. Uh, we have lots of other great questions that we will uh, try to summarize, and we'll, we'll capture and provide a response to all those in attendance. Uh, we hope you found this helpful. We would love to hear from you. You will learn more from, we will, we would love to hear from you and learn more from you about your specific challenges or circumstances. Please remember to register for our next session in the series and complete the survey you will receive following the session. We value your feedback. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future.